This much is certain. On June 19, 1982, just outside Detroit, Vincent Chin, 27 years old of Chinese ancestry, a working class American citizen, engaged to be married the following week, went out with friends for a bachelor's party. At a strip club, they encountered two other men, Ronald Ebens and his stepson, Michael Nitz. There was an altercation. It continued outside. Sometime later, and a few blocks away, Nitz held Chin down as Ebens swung a baseball bat. The bridegroom's head was split open. Blood, spinal fluid, and cerebral matter pooled onto the pavement beneath him as he collapsed into a coma. Four days later, Chin died. In state court, Ebens and Nitz faced criminal charges. They accepted a plea bargain. At the sentencing, the prosecutors failed to appear. Judge Charles Kaufman imposed on each man three years probation, a $3,000 fine, and court costs. Everything else is disputed. There would be two federal criminal trials, a protest movement, and more publicity than had ever been devoted to any incident involving an Asian American. Yet the context, the causes, the consequences of the Vincent Chin case all have been the subject of great controversy. Although the Vincent Chin case has ceased to be infamous, for Asian Americans, it has never stopped being iconic. The Vincent Chin case is very much a part of our legacy as Asian Americans. This afternoon, we will explore that legacy by reenacting portions of the court proceedings for you, drawing from the transcripts and court decisions. The words you will hear are the actual words with minor editing for length. We begin with the sentencing in Wayne County Circuit Court on March 16, 1983. Ebens and Nitz were charged with second degree murder, but the prosecutors offered a plea bargain to manslaughter. Both men accepted, with Ebens pleading guilty and Nitz no contest. At sentencing, both men were represented by counsel, as was common at the time because of the high volume of cases and lack of resources in Wayne County, no prosecutor appeared nor were the victim's family and friends notified of the proceedings. Defense lawyer Bruce Saperstein spoke on behalf of Ebens and argued that Chin had been the instigator. Your Honor, but for the physical assault by the victim in this case, the victim initiating the physical assault, this crime would never have been committed. Mr. Ebens and Mr. Nitz were seated and the victim walked up and punched Mr. Evans in the face. During the scuffle, Mr. Nitz had his head cut open, was bleeding profusely, and in fact, required stitches. Either side, Your Honor, could have been the victim in this case. They could have changed places in this particular case. I think Your Honor would agree that in looking at the background, and the background of Mr. Evans is impeccable, that Mr. Evans is not a heinous criminal. I don't believe that rehabilitation is even in order in this case. I'm confident this would never happen again. And God knows those gentlemen would like to see this man back, but we can't change what happened here. With respect to punishment, Your Honor, Mr. Evans is being punished every day of his life over this incident. He can't change that. He has to live with this. His work background is excellent. 17 years at Chrysler. Uh, Mr. Evans, do you wish to say something? Only that I'm deeply sorry about what had happened. And if there's any way that I could change it, I sure would. I was looking to see if there was any background on the victim. Do you have any background on him? Did the victim have a criminal record? I don't have any background on him either way, Your Honor. It's the judgment of this court that each of the defendants be placed on probation for a period of three years. In addition, I will require that each of you pay $260 a year at the rate of $25 a month. That each of you pay an additional fine in the amount of $3,000 at the rate of $100 per month. I will leave the question of restitution to civil proceedings. Judge Kaufman did not explain his reasoning for imposing a sentence of probation, 
But months later, in an interview, he stated that, These weren't the kind of men you send to jail. You don't make the punishment fit the crime. You make the punishment fit the criminal. Traditionally, Asian Americans had believed they should not make waves. And Asian Americans had been reluctant to discuss the issue of race. They did not know the language of civil rights, and in the early 1980s, the subject was largely black and white anyway. The Asian American community, however, was galvanized by the notion that a Chinese American could be beaten to death because of his race, with his killers sentenced only to probation and a fine. The two men were white auto workers in Detroit, one being out of work, at a time when the U.S. auto industry was under tremendous pressure from Japanese imports. Detroit in 1982 was perhaps the hardest place in the country to be Asian American. You had the face of the enemy. Anti-Japanese sentiment was at its height. There was taunting, violence, public displays, including scenes of politicians and union leaders demolishing Japanese imported cars, that Jap crap, with sledgehammers. It was against this setting that Asian Americans found cause to speak up. For the first time, Asian Americans crossed ethnic and socioeconomic lines to join together to seek justice for Vincent Chin, led by, among others, attorney Liza Chan, journalist Helen Zia, who is with us today, and Vincent's mother, Lily Chin. A number of Asian Americans formed American Citizens for Justice. Their efforts to publicize the, the case were remarkably successful. The extensive publicity was virtually unanimous in its criticism of the sentence, the judge, the prosecutors, and the two defendants. The case was described as an outrage, the product of racism. In June 1983, Lisa Chan, Lily Chin, and others met with the Justice Department in Washington, D.C. to urge the government to bring federal criminal civil rights charges against Ebens and Nitz. Because of ACJ's efforts, the Justice Department received thousands of letters and signatures on petitions urging it to prosecute Ebens and Nitz. In November 1983, a federal grand jury in Detroit indicted Ebens and Nitz for interfering with Chin's right to use and enjoy a place of public accommodation, the Fancy Pants Lounge, on account of his race and conspiracy to do the same. The case was assigned to Judge Anna Diggs Taylor, one of the first African-American women to be appointed to any federal court in the country. It was extensively litigated with numerous pretrial motions, including a motion to dismiss the indictment on the grounds that the federal civil rights laws applied only to blacks and that Orientals, considered by many to be white, were not protected. There was also a motion for a change of venue because of the adverse pretrial publicity. Both motions were denied. Trial commenced on June 5, 1984. It was undisputed that Ebens and Nitz killed Vincent Chin, but there was sharp dispute over the issue of motivation. The government had to prove Ebens and Nitz acted because of Chin's race. We turn now to the opening statements from United States versus Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz, the first of the two federal trials. Theodore Merritt from the Justice Department opened for the government while defense attorney David Lawson spoke for Ebens. May it please the court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the evidence will show that on June 19, 1982, a brutal crime was committed on the streets in Highland Park. On that night, the defendant, Ronald Ebens, helped by his co-defendant, Michael Nitz, repeatedly beat with a baseball bat a Chinese-American citizen of the United States by the name of Vincent Chin, and beat him so badly that he died four days later from massive head injuries. And the evidence will prove that Vincent Chin died at the hands of these defendants because he was a Chinese American and because he was enjoying the entertainment at a public bar. The evidence will show that this fatal assault was preceded an hour or so earlier by a confrontation at that bar between Vincent Chin and the defendants. The confrontation was caused by Ronald Eben's barrage of obscenities, baiting and racial insults directed at Vincent Chin. 
What happened in Highland Park that night was a story of ugly racism, which turned violent. Now the burden is on the government to prove not only that Ronald Ebens and Michael Nitz were responsible for the death of Vincent Chin, but also to show that they killed Vincent Chin because of his race and with the intent to prevent him from uh, enjoying the use of fancy pants lounge. Now we do not believe the evidence will prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Mr. Ebens acted because of Vincent Chin's race. We believe the evidence will show that this was not a civil rights case, but in fact was a fight between angry and intoxicated men that ended regrettably in the death of one of them. Lawson gave Ebens' version of the altercation. He attacked the government's witnesses and suggested that the issue of race was a fabrication. The witnesses will tell you that Ebens was in an outrage, that he began swinging the bat at Vincent Chin, that the bat struck Mr. Chin several times, including the head, the neck, and other parts of his body. Mr. Chin, they will say, fell to the street with a mortal wound to his head and that he died four days later. As a result, Ronald Evans was charged with murder. He pleaded guilty in the Wayne County Circuit Court to manslaughter. Then something happened in that court on March 16, 1983, which set off a chain of events which has resulted in our being here today in this trial. And that was that Ron Evans got probation for killing Vincent Chin. Now, naturally, such a sentence in a case such as this upset and enraged Mr. Chin's family and friends, and also members of his community. And you will hear evidence that after the sentence of probation, Mr. Chin's friends and others met and tried to come up with some evidence that would turn this homicide into a federal civil rights case. We expect that the government will try every opportunity to inject some evidence of racial sayings or racial acts into this case. Because of the massive publicity in this case, because of the influence placed on the witnesses, because of the strong beliefs held by some members of Vince Chin's community, that there was evidence to support the government's charges, we expect that the testimony of witnesses will be distorted and changed and fabricated to support the government's charges. One of the most important witnesses was Racine Caldwell, one of the dancers at the Fancy Pants Lounge. As one of the jurors revealed in a post-trial interview, Caldwell was seen as a neutral witness who had no reason to lie. Her testimony was, her testimony was critical on the issue of motivation. Where are you employed, Ms. Caldwell? Fancy Pants. Now, Ms. Caldwell, let me ask you to direct your attention to the night of June 19, 1982. Were you working at Fancy Pants? Yes, I was. And did you see Vincent Chin in the Fancy Pants that night? That evening, yeah. And what was his mood when you saw him? He was, he was laughing and he was joking. Now, did you dance that night? Yes, I did. And did you see Vincent and his friends while you were dancing? Yes, I did. How long did you dance, anyway? Uh, approximately 12 minutes. And how was Vincent acting while you were up on the stage? Happy, laughing. Now what did you do after you finished dancing? So I got off the stage and I went back to freshen up in the dressing room and then I came back out to talk to the customers. And did anything happen while you were out there talking to the customers? Yeah, um, I came close to a couple of people that was, you know, loud talking like arguing and I turn around and I seen Vincent and a couple people arguing. And do you see the man in the courtroom today that you saw arguing with Vincent? Yes. And can you point him out if you can? He has the blue shirt and blue tie. And what did you hear the defendant say? All I heard him say when I turned around is, it's because of you little motherfuckers that we're out of work. And after you heard that, what else did you hear? So Vincent came back with a remark like, I'm not a little motherfucker, and then it was stated to him, well, I'm not sure if you're a big one or a little one, and then by that time he got mad. 
And who said that to Vincent? That gentleman over there. Did you hear Vincent make any comments directed at the defendant? No, I mean, not other than I'm not a little motherfucker. Did he ever call the defendant anything? No, not that I heard. And in what tone of voice was the defendant talking to Vincent? In a loud tone of voice. And what happened then? So then he pushed him on the shoulder, you know, kind of hard, and he pushed him, and then they got into a fight, and then the younger fellow jumped in and started helping him. And who was that? That's the gentleman that started helping the older man when he was hitting Vince. And did you subsequently learn his name? Yes, Michael Nitz. David Lawson, cross-examined for Mr. Ebens. Ms. Cola. Mr. Evans was speaking in a loud tone of voice? Yeah, like argument-like, as if I was arguing with somebody. Was he actually shouting? Well, I mean, I could hear him over the music. Now, when you heard him, what did you hear him shout? Because of you little motherfuckers, we are out of work. And then Vincent responded? I'm not a little motherfucker. All right, now when you were making the rounds and talking to customers, was that part of your job? Yeah. And was it also part of your job at Fancy Pants to solicit customers? No, it was not. You were asking them if they wanted a lap dance, weren't you? No, I was not. Vincent was one of your favorite customers, wasn't he? I, I mean, he was a customer. I, I liked him, but he wasn't a personal friend. <laughs> but you did like him a lot, didn't you? Yeah. And you'd like to see him come into the Fancy Pants Lounge, didn't you? Sure. Thank you. Another important witness was Jimmy Choi. He and two other of Vincent's friends, Gary Koivu and Bob Sarosky, were celebrating with Vincent that night. On direct examination, Choi described the events leading up to the bachelor party and then testified about the encounter with Evans and Nitz. Now, how loud was the music on the stage? It was not blasting like, it was just the volume was normal. So you could carry on a conversation with the person next to you? Yes, Gary. And what about the people who were across the stage from you? Could you hear what they were saying in that conversation? No, I didn't pay too much attention at first, and then after a while I heard a few things. What did you hear, and where did it come from? I was in the bar for about 15, 20 minutes, and then I heard someone mention foreign cars from across the stage. I didn't pay too much attention. I just glanced around and resumed talking to Gary. Did you hear anything else coming from that side of the stage? Then I heard Vincent saying something first, okay? He was talking across the stage. And did you hear any other statements from the men across the stage? Yes. I heard the word nips crawl, calling toward our direction, and I recall Vincent saying that we are not Japanese. So that is what you referred to when you understood them to mean? I understood it to be slang for Japanese. Now when you looked over and you saw, well, did you see who was making the statements? Yes. Do you see him in the courtroom? Yes. Can you point him out? Yes. May the record reflect that the witness has identified defendant Evans. So noted. Now when you looked over, was he looking over on your side of the table when he said nips? Yes, across in our direction. Did there come a time when you heard some more words exchanged across the table? Yes, I heard Vincent say in a loud voice, don't call me motherfucker, I am not a motherfucker. And then what? Then I heard the gentleman say, big fucker, little fucker, we are all fuckers. And what happened after he made that statement? Vincent kept on saying, don't call me a motherfucker. And then he got mad and said, come on, let's get outside. And what did Vincent do? Came around the stage, went over to where the two gentlemen were sitting. The man with the gray hair stood, and Vincent punched him. And then what happened? Then they started exchanging blows. Choi continued to describe the scuffling in the bar 
And then he moved on to what happened outside. And what did they do? They just went to the car, lifted up the hatchback, and pulled out a baseball bat. And did you see which one got the baseball bat? The man there. The man you identified as Mr. Evans? Yes. And what did he do when he got the baseball bat? He started in a, not a run, something like a trot. He was holding the bat like this. And Vincent said, I'm not going to fight you with a baseball bat. And then they kept on coming, so Vincent ran away from them. And they pursued Vincent? Yes, they did. Troy explained that Evans and Nitz were unable to catch Chin. They returned and asked the other two members of the group, Gary Koivu and Bob Swarovski, where's your friend? Troy testified that when Ebens and Nitz saw him, they said, let's get this little fucker. At that point, Troy ran away as well. He eventually found Vincent, and the two stopped at a parking lot in front of McDonald's. We continue with Troy's direct testimony. So then what happened? Well, we were still sitting. Then all of a sudden I heard Vincent say, scram. I turned around and saw the two men right behind us, some three to five steps. And what did you do? Well, I scrammed. I ran towards north of McDonald's right off the bat. How far did you run? 30 yards, then I turned back. And what did you see? I saw Vincent running across, just about getting to the medium of the cars. Then the younger man came up and grabbed him from behind, pulling him down. Then they were scuffling and the older man came with the bat. And what did you see when he approached Vincent with the bat? He approached. Vincent was still trying to get away from him. And then the older man, he could not run too fast. He kind of hobbled. He took a swing at Vincent's knees. And then what happened? At that point, on the knees, one swing, upper section of Vincent, and he blocked it like this. And then what happened? What did you see Vincent do? Well, he was going down slowly and the old man took a swing right at his head. And what did you do? I don't know, I was just like I couldn't believe it. I was going, I couldn't believe it. And what else did you see? Well, it seemed like slow motion. Uh, Vincent was going down and then I saw another blow. Then he was kind of in a crawling position. And then it was in a frenzy like, well, he was swinging. He was saying something about, which I could not hear, he was mumbling. How many times did you see him swing the bat? The first blow I saw very vividly. And where did that first blow land? Right here. And after that? One more blow to the head while Vincent was going down. He kept on swinging. And I don't know whether it was connecting or not, but I couldn't believe it. And what did you do? Well, I ran back. I just ran toward the direction right to Vincent. And what did you see when you got there? Well, all of a sudden I saw guns, service guns. And then I stopped abruptly and I saw a black man holding the gun. Pulled out a badge and, and told the other man to drop his bat. Now, when you went over to Vincent, was he conscious? He was still conscious. And was he saying anything? Yes, I cradled his head and I said, hey Vince, you all right? And he was saying, fight, fight, not fair. And was he speaking Chinese? In Chinese. And then what did you do? I said, somebody get a bloody ambulance. I didn't see anyone move, so I ran into McDonald's and I called the ambulance. Then did you go back outside? Yes, I ran straight to Vincent. And was he still conscious? He was still conscious. And then I said, OK, Vincent. I shook his hand, you know, snap up, snap up, snap up. The ambulance will be right here. I was holding his hand uh, all that time. Now, did you travel with him in the ambulance? Yes, I did. And did you say anything to the defendants before you got in the ambulance? Yes. I saw them talking to the police officers, saying something like, I didn't mean to hurt this boy, and he said, my son is hurt. And I was totally outraged. I said, if I had a gun, I would shoot you both right here. 
And then you got in the ambulance? Yes. One of defense counsel's principal themes on cross-examination was that Choi had been unduly influenced by others. Choi and other witnesses had met as a group before trial with Liza Chan, the attorney who helped form American Citizens for Justice. Chan met with the witnesses to prepare them for their testimony. The meetings were recorded and the recordings were transcribed. Defense counsel wanted to introduce the recordings into evidence to show that the witnesses colluded to come up with evidence that race was a motivating factor. The government objected to the tapes as hearsay. Judge Taylor sustained the objection, although she permitted defense counsel to confront a witness with his own words on the tape, but only his own words. She ruled that Liza Chan's statements to the witnesses could be introduced only through her, and only if she were called to the stand. Frank Eamon, one of Evans's attorneys, cross-examined Choi. Well, Mr. Choi, you have been asked a lot of questions by a lot of people before coming to court today, correct? Yes. And one of those people was Lisa Chan? Yes. Now, you met with several people about what happened at the Fancy Pants Lounge, and that included the meeting with Lisa Chan in April, with the FBI in May, and with Lisa Chan again in May. Do you remember those meetings? Yes, I do. And you knew that at each of those meetings that the FBI was investigating a civil rights violation? Exactly. And you knew, did you not, that the investigation was not about whether those men did what they did? Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Choi does not know what the point of the investigation was. His question has no foundation. It goes to the witness's state of mind, Your Honor. Overruled. Now you knew, did you not, that the investigation was whether these men were motivated in doing this act because of your friend's race? I object again, Your Honor. Mr. Choi did not know what the investigation was, and the investigation did not have any particular aim in its course. I'm going to let Mr. Choi answer the question, counsel. This is cross-examination. Did you know that? I had a vague idea. A vague idea? Yes. Sir, you knew that it was significant whether any racial remarks were made inside the fancy pants. Did you know the significance of that? I knew the significance. But I did tell the truth. Choi acknowledged that he did not recall using racial terms when he had spoken earlier to Lisa Chan and the FBI. In trying to explain why not, Choi echoed certain familiar themes. Asian Americans don't make waves, don't complain about discrimination, and don't use race as an excuse. And can you explain that? When you met with Lisa Chan in April, why you did not tell her that you heard the word nip. Okay, because that was when the prosecution at the state level, okay, ended. I was in Toronto for my internship. I got back and I didn't know what happened. And all of a sudden this lady lawyer came to me and I was not prepared, not as much as I wanted to be. I don't ever want to mention discrimination. And she was going for the criminal portion of the case. She didn't ask me about discrimination. And I thought about it, more things popped up to me. Since April of 1983, the more you thought about it, the more these remarks have popped up? It depends. It all depends on what has popped up in my memory. All of a sudden, little things, a few things came back to me. Well, let me just clear it up, if I might. When you met with Lisa Chan in April of 1983, you knew that was after these men were sentenced to probation. I knew that, yes. Okay. Do you remember Lisa Chan asking you, nobody actually heard anything? I mean, actually heard how it started. What started it? And you, in answering, said, I would believe that Ebens might have made a smart-ass remark. Do you remember telling her that? Yes. And I guess you are telling us today that in April of 1983, you didn't remember that the word nip had been used. Yes. Okay. Do you remember also at that interview in April of 1983 being asked by someone, besides that, did they say anything like Chinaman and things like that, that type of thing, just the four-letter word, and in answering them, you said, 
I had not heard that. I don't think they made any racial remarks, nothing. Did you tell Lisa Chan that? Yes, I did. Now, when you met with the FBI agent in May, you did not remember yet that the word nip had been used, correct? No. Mr. Choi, am I correct that the first time you mentioned the use of the word nip was before the grand jury? Yes. <clears throat> At these meetings that you had with other witnesses, do you remember with Gary Koivu and Bob Sarosky? Well, we had a meeting, yes, we did. And you each talked about what each of you had seen and heard that evening? Yes, we did. And do you remember what you asked Gary, whether he heard, uh, whether he heard you say anything about, we are not Japanese? Cannot recall, that was a year and a half ago. This is just like three conversations and everyone was talking. We were like, what do you remember? Well, do you remember that? That is the extent of the meeting. Now, some people didn't remember some things, right? Yes, a few things, okay. Somebody said, okay, well, you did that, and I said, yes, I remember that. Yes, I kind of have an idea now. Well, was the purpose of the meeting to get the stories together for this case? No, sir. Now, did you receive advice from anyone? about what parts of this story to tell and what parts not to tell. I didn't receive any advice to that effect. I was advised to tell the truth and the whole truth. Don't you believe, Mr. Choi, that, Ms. that Vincent got angry and overly reacted? I don't think he overly reacted. Didn't you tell Lisa Chan that in your opinion he overly reacted? Will you look at page 11 of the transcript? Let me think. Um, I did. I made a mistake. He did not overly react. He tried to ignore any racial remarks that were happening. You, you, you do have a copy of your transcript, don't, don't you, Mr. Uh, Choi? Look, look in the middle okay. of page All right. 11. All right. Um, well, I'm did. referring to right in the middle of page 11. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. Well, I did say that. Okay. So you do recall saying that then? I read it, yes. Okay. Now, at the time that you said that, you were describing to Lisa Chan in April events which, to the best of your memory, were completely devoid of racial provocation. Well, there was a time, okay, for Chinese, we try not to, shall I say, react. Usually we can take a lot of things. There was a time when I just asked basically, in the bar, how did he grab him? How did he swing the bat? And she was not looking for racial remarks. And if you go there, it was not a very good place to go to in the first place. I didn't want to do anything. Plus, I tried to shun all the racial things away from me. I had a few experiences, mostly when I deal with classmates at school. But a few times, when somebody like drives by and just told me, chink, I tried to brush it aside. After the government rested, the defendants put on a brief defense case. Ebens chose to testify. Mr. Ebens, what happened when you sat down at the bar? <clears throat> sat down, I think I got one sip of the glass of beer and this black dancer was dancing and I remember comments coming from across the stage directed at her telling her what a crummy dancer she was, okay? Did you see who was making those comments? Uh, I don't really know who was making those comments. You know that they were coming across from across the stage, yes. though, right? What did you do then? Well, I don't like seeing people getting disrespected, for starters. Okay, so what did you do? I made a comment to the effect of that, um, you know, don't worry about those guys. Show them what a, a good dancer you are. Did you direct those comments to anybody in particular? No, just the dancer. Did you say anything else? Um, not at the time that I remember. When you made those comments, do you recall referring to the people across the stage using the term fucker or motherfucker? I don't remember distinctly. Could you have said that? Yes, I could have. Do you or have you ever used words like that before? Many times. Is that language unusual to you? Uh, no, it isn't. 
when you use those words, if you did, was it your intention to insult anyone or provoke anyone? No. What happened next? Well, I remember at this point, the Oriental, I was sitting, uh, the second from the end, saying something to the man on his left, which I couldn't pick up, okay, and, and he got up. Okay, at that point, did you notice that he was an Oriental person? No, I probably did. Do you recall the testimony in this court that Vincent Chin stood up and said, don't call me a motherfucker? Yes. Do you recall hearing that in the bar that night? Not to think for no. Do you recall hearing it at all? No, I don't. Do you recall testimony in court that you stood up and said, big fuckers, little fuckers, we're all fuckers? Do you remember that testimony? Yes. Did you say that? I don't remember saying it. Could you have said it? Yes, I could have said that. When you saw the person say something to the other gentleman on his left, what is the next thing that happened after that? I, I really didn't pay much attention to him. I was watching the dancer. He proceeded around, and I guess the next time I was really aware of him is when I turned around and he was standing directly in front of me. What happened then? He punched me. Up to that point, did you call him, or anyone else for that matter, the word chink? No. Do you recall calling anyone a nip? No. Do you recall saying anything about being out of work or words to that effect? No. Did you say those words? No. We move to Ebens' testimony that he and Nitz were driving in their car when they saw Vincent and Jimmy Choi outside McDonald's. All right, what happened next? Well, and as we drove by, Michael seen him sitting out in front of the steps of, you know, whatever it was out there, and, and sitting there laughing, and they must have been, you know, real funny to him. How did you feel at that point? I was angry. Why? Same reason, I guess. You know, the man had sucker punched me, and he was responsible for splitting Mike's head open. And I just got angry. What did you do? I told Mike to park the car. When you got out of the car, did you have the bat with you? Yes. What did you do then? Well, I ran around to where they were sitting, and I hollered at them. Then what did you do? Well, I said, you sons of bitches. And then, then what? Well, they jumped up and started to run, and I was on top of them and took a swing and caught Chin in the arm. You took a swing with the bat? Yes, sir. Caught him in the arm? Yes. What happened then? Well, I, I more or less just stopped because they took off running. And what happened after that? Mike came around and he caught Chin in the middle of the lane of traffic out there. What did you do then? But when I seen Mike scuffling, it just flashed in my mind. You know, he's going to get hurt again. And I started toward him and, I don't know, something just snapped. I don't remember from there on what did happen. Did you hit Mr. Chin? Not that I remember. Were you trying to kill Mr. Chin, Mr. Evans? No. Do you remember what you were trying to do? No, I don't. What is the next thing that you remember? I remember looking up and seeing a revolver pointed at me and a man saying, drop the bat. Okay, thanks. The prosecution cross-examined. Well, Mr. Evans, you told us a lot about that night. But now you tell us that you blacked out. And you can't tell us much about the beating, is that right? That is true. Let me show you Government Exhibit 14. Is this the bat that you used to kill Vincent Chin? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Could you show us how you were holding the bat when you asked Gary and Bob, where's your friend? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Now, when you were in the car saying, when I catch these Chinese guys, I'm going to bust their heads, you hadn't blacked out yet? I never said that. When you found Vincent Chin and said, there they are, you hadn't blacked out yet? I don't know. So only when you caught up with Vincent Chin and started swinging the bat at him, that's when you blacked out. Is that your testimony? Yeah, just prior to it. You can't remember hitting Vincent Chin in the head so he couldn't run away. No. You don't remember hitting him in the arms? No. You can't remember hitting him in the head, the chest, and the shoulder? No, I can't remember. 
And you can't remember hitting him in the head as he was lying on the ground? No, I can't. And you can't remember telling the police that you're sorry, but look what they did to your son. You remember that, don't you? Not really. You had the presence of mind to think of an explanation, didn't you? I don't remember being asked for an explanation. Mr. Evans, maybe if you would take the bat, it'll bring something back. Objection, Your Honor. I've had enough with this Okay, bat. ask a question. He's ask a question. That's a not a question. Understood, counsel. Yes, all right. Mr. Evans, have you ever chased a man because of a drunken fight and beat him to death? No. Outside of this time, only Vincent Chin. <laughs> and because he looked like Vincent Chin, isn't that right, Mr. Evans? No, that's not right. The lawyers summed up on June 26, 1984, focusing on the issue of motivation. There's only one reasonable explanation for Vincent Chin's brutal killing. In the minds of Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz, Vincent Chin was a chink who dared to stand up to them. Vincent Chin and his friends were having a good time, spending a lot of money, and that bothered Ronald Evans. And Ronald Evans began a barrage of racial insults, obscenities directed to Chin's mother. He was talking about foreign cars, and because of you motherfuckers, we in the auto industry are out of work. But ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to decide that Ronald Evans and Michael Nitz acted with any racial intent just on the basis of a few derogatory remarks. Rather, examine what they did and you'll be convinced why they did it. When they walked into the Fancy Pants Lounge that night, they could only know two things about Vincent Chin. That he was an Oriental and that he was having a good time. They, of course, had never met him before. They saw an Oriental acting flamboyant, spending a lot of money. How do you think Ronald Evans reacted to that? Now the racial animal inside Ronald Evans had been unleashed, and now his prey was anything Oriental. The brutality and the ferocity of the attack on Vincent Chin tell you that this was no mere barroom brawl that got out of hand. After Michael Nitz got Mr. Chin in a bear hug, even savage and repeated use of that bat, even after Chin lay motionless on the pavement, cannot be reasonably explained by mere anger or revenge. The defendants are wrong in saying that this was nothing more than a barroom fight. This was violent hatred turned loose. This was years of pent-up racial hostilities and rage unleashed. This was a modern-day lynching, but there was a bat instead of a rope. Defense counsel argued that the issue of race was a fabrication. Ladies and gentlemen, how did this tragic incident become infused with race? Meetings with witnesses began to take place, and into this scenario if of intoxicated violence, witnesses began to inject, as Jimmy Choi says, their thoughts and their ideas and images of possible racist motivations. A transformation of facts occurs because people went back to take a second look at what happened and to see if they could come up with any evidence to support a second prosecution. Suddenly, when Vincent Chin said, I'm not a motherfucker, it was in response not to simply being called a motherfucker, but instead to being called a chink, a nip, to some reference about being out of work and foreign cars. What had never been a racial incident became one, and it became one gradually. That's why we have three different racial allegations by three different people surfacing at three different times. People worked hard with each other and their attorneys, searching the dark recesses of their minds to find something, anything, that could make this a racial event. 
Vincent Chin was the same as Ronald Evans, a human being. He was not a person who had only great virtues and no faults. Vincent Chin got drunk and he went to nude bars and he started a fight and then he wanted to finish the fight. And Mr. Evans, like Vincent Chin, became full of rage and Mr. Evans wanted revenge. Vincent Chin wanted to finish the fight. Does this make him a hero or a martyr? None of this happened to Vincent Chin because of his race. On June 28, 1984, the jury returned its verdict. Will the four person please rise? Madam four person, do you have a unanimous verdict for each of the counts, for each of the two defendants? We have, Your Honor. Will the clerk please read the verdict? In the case of United States of America versus Ronald Evans and Michael Nix, the verdict form reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant Michael Nix not guilty as to count one and not guilty as to count two. We, the jury, find the defendant Ronald Evans not guilty as to count one and guilty as to count two. The jury thus found Evans guilty of violating the civil rights of Vincent Chin on account of his race. He was sentenced on September 18, 1984. After hearing from defense counsel, Judge Taylor gave Evans an opportunity to be heard, and then, without elaboration, she tersely announced her sentence. Mr. Evans, is there anything you would like to say? Only, Your Honor, I have expressed my regret and my remorse on several occasions, and I would just like to reiterate that one more time. I am sorry for what happened. I can't say anything more than that. At this point, I have no recourse but to depend on the American system of justice and you, Your Honor. Is that all? It is adjudged, Mr. Evans, that you are committed to the custody of the Attorney General for a period of 25 years. It will be recommended that you be committed to an institution where you may receive treatment for alcohol abuse. Evans appealed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Judge Albert J. Engel issued the court's decision on September 11, 1986. The court addressed several issues, including Evans's argument that the federal civil rights laws did not extend to Orientals. The court rejected this argument, holding that the statute protected any person because of his race, color, religion, or national origin from intimidation or interference with the enjoyment of a place of public accommodation. Citing Yik Wo versus Hopkins, Judge Engel wrote, Orientals come within the broad constitutional protections of the 14th Amendment, even though the original thrust of the amendment was primarily motivated by concern for the rights of black persons. Judge Engel also rejected the argument that Judge Taylor aired in refusing to transfer the case because of the pretrial publicity. We have carefully reviewed the extensive record made of the publicity in the case and agreed that it was indeed pervasive. The nearly unanimous public judgment that Evans and his stepson should have received jail terms and the harsh criticism of the state trial judge followed by the federal prosecution of the defendants based on the same, con same incident, were bound to lead to a strong public impression that justice had not been done in the state court and that it was incumbent upon the federal government to right that wrong by a second prosecution. While it probably would have been advisable for the trial judge to have ordered a change of venue, we conclude that there was not reversible error 
for the trial judge to proceed to impanel the jury. Ultimately, however, the Sixth Circuit held that Ebens had been denied a fair trial. The court concluded that Judge Taylor erred in allowing a witness to testify about racist remarks about blacks purportedly made by Ebens some 10 years earlier. The court also strongly disapproved of what it described as inflammatory language by the prosecution in summation. The court was most troubled, however, by Judge Taylor's ruling not to allow the defense to introduce the tape recordings of the meetings Lisa Chan had had with the witnesses. Ebens and the co-defendant Nets sought to introduce into evidence tape recordings of interviews which had been conducted by Lisa Chan with these witnesses. The defense purpose was to demonstrate that the witness's testimony concerning Ebens' racist statements was false and that it was the result of improper coaching of them by Chan in preparation for the trial. Each time defendants sought to introduce the tapes, however, the court sustained the government's objection on hearsay grounds. The government concedes that these rulings were erroneous. We unanimously conclude that a consideration of the relevant factors mandates reversal. Ebens should have been permitted to introduce into evidence the entire contents of the tapes. The three witnesses were the most crucial of all witnesses for the government. It is true that the district court, district court permitted the, defendants to, the defense to elicit a few of the statements, but it was not within the province of the court's proper discretion to prevent the jury from hearing the tapes themselves and judging for themselves the impact upon the witnesses which the purported conversations had and measuring that against the statements made in court by the witnesses. The Court of Appeals was so troubled by what it heard on the tapes that it included as an appendix to its decision excerpts from the meeting of Lisa Chan and Choi, Koi Vu, and Swarovski on May 17, 1983. Lisa Chan was only three years out of law school at the time, and she was not a litigator. She met with the witnesses as a group, and she recorded the conversations. We reenact portions of the meeting for you now. The purpose of this meeting tonight is so we can all help each other remember exactly what happened, how it happened, when it happened, and all the minor details, okay? I was talking this afternoon with the parking lot attendant, the black guy, and according to his version of the facts, it's quite different from what I've so far understood them to be. So I would center on that, on what the three of you say they are and somehow try to fit all the facts around these. We will agree, this is the story, this is it. When it's a federal prosecution, we're all going to have to be agreeing on this is what happened. Now, if you don't agree, like you definitely remembered certain things happen. Say, you think it's a black car and you think it's a white car. And we think kind of, okay, other than that, we should just all have it down pat. Is it five minutes? Is it 10 minutes? Is it more like eight minutes? Let's, let's all just agree. Otherwise, you're gonna look funny on the stand. You all were supposedly there. Well, is there any harm in getting too accurate? Because they could say, well, you all rehearsed this. Like, I mean, if you're in the courtroom and we all have exactly the same times. Good question. So as long as you're within, you know, I mean, you could say 10, you could say 820. I mean, that doesn't matter. Mm, right, but as long as they have an example. Right, so, but as far as the crucial facts, the crucial facts cannot conflict. So I'll give you an example. Like what you people have been telling me and then what the parking lot attendant told me, it totally makes me confused. That's gonna be raising a question in the jury's mind. Well, who's telling the truth? What actually happened? Maybe no one's to be believed. Now, I don't mean exactly everyone agree, like everyone's to agree that it was 6.30 right on the dot, okay? But I mean, you know, you can't say that we stayed at the fancy pants for two hours and then have another person say we stayed at the fancy pants for half an hour. I mean, that's a big discrepancy. Right. So then, Vincent started out of the chair? Yeah. 
You ran over? Yeah. So that's, you remember? That's why I remember just before you got up, <clears throat> don't call me a motherfucker, I remember that. Okay, so we all remember our different lines. There's no agreement that, well that's fine, just remember your different lines. Right. Chink, foreign cars, big fucker, little fucker, all fuckers, don't call me a fucker. We all remember our lines, okay? I'm just guessing, it's just logical, you know? I mean, I, I could be wrong. So he said, I just don't remember whether you're a big fucker or a little fucker, because he had said earlier, big fuckers, little fuckers, we're all fuckers. Maybe that's how they thought they heard that. Uh, I just don't know whether you're a big one or a little one. Right. Yeah, could be. Okay. But after I tapped Vincent, and even said, I just don't know if you're a big or little fucker, that's when Vincent said, I told you, I'm not a fucker, friend. Did anybody hear that? I, I didn't hear that, but you know, he's talking to him, and you know, I might have saw him point out to the, no, I can't say something like that. I think I heard him say, uh, nobody calls me a motherfucker. I, I can't even say that. Hmm. The record did contain other evidence that race had been a motivating factor, evidence that was not tainted even arguably by the Lisa Chan meeting. For example, in addition to Racine Caldwell, the fancy pants dancer who had testified that Ebens yelled at Vincent, it's because of you little motherfuckers that were out of work, Jimmy Perry, a bystander near the fancy pants lounge, testified he had been given $20 by Ebens and Nitz to help them find, quote, two Chinese guys so that they could, quote, bust their heads. And, as the prosecution argued, the brutality and ferocity of the attack may have been proof that this was not just another barroom brawl, but an attack driven by race and bigotry. The Sixth Circuit reversed the judgment of conviction and remanded the case to Judge Taylor for a new trial. On remand, Ebens renewed his motion for a change of venue because of the adverse publicity. This time, Judge Taylor granted the motion. She observed that there had been even more publicity about the case since the first trial. Most damaging of all the post-reversal coverage in the view of this court was the October 12, 1986 Detroit News Magazine cover story on the victim's mother, Lily Chin. The magazine cover was comprised of full-page color photographs of the still-grieving mother the lengthy story inside, accompanied by more photographs, told of the tragic deterioration of her life to that of a homeless wanderer since the death of her son. The effect of this major feature alone in the newspaper of largest circulation in Michigan and Northern Ohio is extremely prejudicial to the court's ability to secure an impartial jury in this area. And even more than that, the leadership of this community, including the president and members of the Detroit City Council, who declared a day of mourning in honor of Vincent Chin and presented a memorial to his mother, have been quoted by the news media uniformly to the effect that the defendant must be punished. Editorial comment, both broadcast and press, and letters to the editor continue strenuously and unanimously to stress the fact that the defendant has never been punished. Judge Taylor ordered a transfer of the case to the Southern District of Ohio, the federal court in Cincinnati. Ironically, the Asian American community's success at publicizing the injustice to Vincent Chin was a factor in causing the transfer of the case from Detroit a city with a black majority and a history of civil rights caught in the economic woes afflicting the automotive industry to Cincinnati, a city known for its southern sensibilities. Indeed, during jury selection in Cincinnati, only 19 of more than 200 prospective jurors said they had even met an Asian American. In addition to the different demographics of the jury pool, the prosecution team faced several new challenges. With memories fading, its witnesses would have to testify to five-year-old events. 
more impeachment material existed in the form of testimony from the first trial. Evidentiary rulings that had gone the government's way the first time had been reversed. And Ebens, whose selective memory had not impressed the jury when he testified in Detroit, did not take the stand in the second trial. It was no surprise then when, on May 1st, 1987, the jury returned a verdict in the Cincinnati courtroom finding Ronald Evans not guilty of violating Vincent Chin's civil rights. The Cincinnati jury was not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Evans' actions had been motivated by Vincent Chin's race. Was race a factor? Eben steadfastly denied that he was motivated by Vincent Chin's race, and in post-trial interviews to this day, he continues to deny that he is a racist. Perhaps Ebens is not a hardcore racist, but perhaps, too, racism may be more ambiguous, complex, and subtle. Clearly, the mix of the recession, alcohol, testosterone, and tempers was a lethal combination. Ebens was not a racist in the conventional simple sense, but he may well have been motivated by racial impulses that he was only dimly aware of, if at all. As he put it in trying to explain his actions, something snapped, and the brutality of his actions led to the death of Vincent Chin. What is the legacy of Vincent Chin? Despite the disappointment of many in the final verdict, the Vincent Chin case had a great impact both on the administration of justice in general and on the Asian American community in particular. The Vincent Chin case sparked a public discourse on the practice of Wayne County prosecutors not to appear for sentencing. The case showed how important it was for prosecutors to participate in sentencing and for victims and their families to begin, be given notice of court proceedings. In the years following the Vincent Chin case, federal and state laws, including in Michigan, were enacted giving victims greater rights. And in the discussions leading to the passage of hate crime laws, the Chin case was often cited. The Vincent Chin case also highlighted the need for reform in sentencing and plea bargaining. Within a month after Judge Kaufman sentenced Ebens and Nitz to probation, the Wayne County prosecutor announced a ban on manslaughter plea bargains in murder prosecutions. On the federal level, the Sentencing Reform Act was passed in 1984 in an effort to reduce disparities in sentencing. As for Asian Americans, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals held that, indeed, Asian Americans were protected by this country's civil rights laws. The murder of Vincent Chin and its aftermath awakened our civil rights consciousness. Asian Americans came together and became a community, one with a voice. For Asian Americans, the death of a man was the birth of a movement. <laughs>